the story of Christ did not end with his death and resurrection. Instead, it culminated with his gift being bestowed on the early church. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so it was. The early church carried the gospel across nations, and what you do when you leave here carries the story further. The Book of Acts. All right. Hey, are you out there this morning with me? Let's go. Let's kick this off. It's a really memorable, memorable Sunday as we do now turn to the book of Acts chapter 1. If you want to use the Bible that's in front of you, I think it's page 1080, bring your Bibles on the next few Sundays. If you want to, use the church app that we have on our app or your favorite uh, Bible app to turn to. Or if you just want to listen and absorb, a lot of people do that, and then they, I give them a manuscript to study further. And anytime you want a study manuscript, just send me an email, pastor at gschurch.us, and you can listen on Sundays and then stir, study further during the week. But let's get into the book of Acts. Yes, what I'm telling you is that here at Good Shepherd, on Sunday morning in the year 2022, we are going to look at all 28 chapters of the book of Acts. Here's what you need to know as we get started. The book of Acts is volume two in a two-volume set, all written by the same author, a man named Luke. What I'm telling you is this. There are four gospels in the part of the Bible we call the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Three of them are one-offs. Matthew wrote his gospel, Mark wrote his gospel, John wrote his gospel, and they were done writing about Jesus in that way. But Luke, he wrote his gospel, the gospel of Luke, but then he wrote volume two, and volume two is called the book of Acts, and what it records is what Jesus continued to do after he went to heaven, what he continued to do through the first Christians, through the early church. Through the 12 apostles and through this remarkable guy who was a missionary and an apostle named Paul. And what's exciting about seeing what Jesus continued to do is that it will help us to see what Jesus continues to do today. We will jump from what he did back then to what he is doing in this world today because we need to get a fresh excitement and vision. we got to gain confidence again that we are living in a time when the Lord is doing great things. Millions of people are coming to Christ every day. Thousands of churches are being planted that did not formerly exist every day. God is at work in the United States, yes, in California, here in the Sacramento area, and he is working powerfully through a church located on, on the corner of Arden and Morse called Good Shepherd Church. And as we catch the pulse of the book of Acts, we will get a fresh pulse of seeing what God is doing and wants to do in our generation. There's a lot of diverse material in the book of Acts, but the theme is very, very central. It's this. The preaching of salvation through Jesus, confirmed by the gift of the Holy Spirit, turns the world up Side down. All right, Acts chapter 1. You can open up your Bibles now if you want to. Let me summarize verses 1 and 2. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1, Luke thanks his benefactor, a guy named Theophilus, and he also gives an incredibly, very brief summary of what he wrote in the Gospel of Luke. And the action really begins to start in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. As you look at it, you will see that it says this. Jesus presented himself alive to them after his suffering. And he did it by many proofs, appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, one of the things that will empower you to be a confident, resilient Christian is to have the exact timeline of Jesus' life and ministry absolutely nailed down. So let's make sure we're all clear on this. He died on Good Friday. He rose again on Resurrection Sunday. And after he rose again on Easter Sunday, he stayed on earth. Did you hear me? After he rose again on Easter Sunday, he stayed here on earth for 40 more days. 
And during that 40-day period after the resurrection, here on earth, it says that he appeared to his apostles and, frankly, to dozens of other people. Why? To prove to them that he was really alive again. It was a lot to take in. They'd seen him die. They'd seen the gruesomeness. They'd seen the gore. They'd seen the awfulness. And so they needed Jesus to literally meet them, look them in the eyes, reach out and touch their hands and say, it's all right. It's me. I'm alive. You're not dreaming. You're not fantasizing. You're not having a psychological bro- you know, breakdown. You're not projecting your wishes on some heavenly whatever. It's really me. Never doubt it again. I've got you. But it also begs a question, right? Can the truth of the Christian religion be proven through historical research and logical deduction? Luke thought so. He used the word proofed that he was alive. I believe that Jesus is alive and that it can be proven. But don't take my word for it or the Bible's word for it. Find out for yourself. If you're that kind of person who needs the rational, solid, scientific, historical, research, logical conclusion that Jesus Christ really is alive again, it's right there for your discovery. And friends, just a a brief summary of all that is, is that it's the only rational explanation for this phenomenon called Christianity. He died 2,000 years ago. And yet, since that time and across 2,000 years, countless billions of people in the past and billions of people today and millions more who will be Christians by the end of this day are saying, why did you become a Christian? Because I met a man who was alive. And now he lives inside of me. Find out why Christians say that. Find out why Christians are absolutely certain that he lives again. Do the research. Put in the study. And ask yourself, is the most logical conclusion about this phenomenon Christian called Christianity that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, really did come back from the dead and is alive forever? <laughs> Verses 4 and verse 5. And while Jesus was staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized merely with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit just a few days from now. There is no doubt, friends, that the apostles were trained, mentored, and equipped to carry on the ministry of Jesus after Jesus went up to heaven. They were meant to repeat his teachings and his sermons. They were meant to show compassion for the crowds and heal the sick, deliver the the demonized. They were called to extend compassion to the least, the lowliest, the most unlikely, to meet people's needs, to move in justice, to show the power of the kingdom, and above all, to preach the life-imparting gospel. There's no question that that is what their function now was going to be, to carry it on and to carry it forward. And Jesus said, now, get started. Go for it. Your first duty is to wait. Say, what? Listen, it's like me, we hire people, your business hires people, a lot of business owners, a lot of people just in all kinds of industries that have employees and everything else. You go through the interview process. You go through the vetting process. You go through the the, uh, cash negotiations. You go through their, their work description, and then they show up on work the first day, right? And the first thing you say is, all right, you're hired. We have so much to do that the first thing I need you to do is wait. That makes no sense. But the first thing that Jesus told them to get started in his ministry was to wait. And oh, I hope that hits you and hits me and hits this church hard. They had to wait first because they were not ready. Now imagine that. 
These men had been personally mentored by Jesus. They were there to see everything he did. They were there to hear everything he said. They even got more teaching after everybody else got the sermon. No one ever had the privilege of being so equipped and so mentored by Jesus, and yet they were still not ready. <clears throat> they needed something. They needed something to do the thing worth calling Christian ministry. They needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit. Without that power, they could not do anything that truly was worthy of Jesus. And I hope the point is so obvious that I don't even have to say it. But I'm a preacher, so of course I'm going to say it anyway. How much more do we need the Holy Spirit to live for Jesus and to minister in his name? They had personal mentorship. I haven't. How much more do we need the Holy Spirit? You know, the source of the frustration and failure of the Christian life is a lack of dependence on the Holy Spirit. And the worst embarrassments and tragedy in the history of the church is when the church tried to operate outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope you're hearing me this morning as we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, and its utter essential necessity to do anything for Jesus and even to live for him one day. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6. So when they had come together, <clears throat> they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of, to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or season that the Father has fixed by his own authority. What are they asking Jesus exactly? Well, let's remember who they were. They were his apostles, and they were also Jews, and they were devout Jewish men of their day and age. And in the day and age of Jesus and the apostles, what did all Jews want? They wanted the coming of their Messiah. All of them. And they wanted the Messiah to do something for them that only the Messiah could do. And very early on, as these guys followed Jesus, they became convinced, this guy, he's the Messiah. This is the one that we were waiting for. This is the one who's going to do great things. And the more they spent their time with Jesus and saw him do miracles, the more convinced that he was the Messiah. And then he died on the cross. And they wondered, how could we have been so completely wrong? <laughs> and then they met him alive and raised from the dead. And they went, oh, now it is so on. And so up there is what they're asking Jesus says, Jesus, is this the time where you're going to make yourself the king of Israel? It's that time now, right? You're going to walk into Jerusalem, reveal yourself to everybody, and you're going to blow their minds. And they're instantly going to make you king, right? And then you're going to make our nation the strongest, most glorious nation in the whole world, Right? And then as you make our nation the greatest nation, you're going to extend your governance to all people everywhere, right? And then when you become the most powerful and prestigious person in the whole world, you're going to give us really good jobs with positions and perks in your whole new government, right? That's what they were asking. And friends, someday Jesus will do all of that and more. Someday he will do all of that. And more. But he told them, this is not that day. This is not that day. And you will never know when that day is. Because only one person has the authority to bring the day of my second coming, my glorious and eternal reign, and a new heaven and a new earth. Only the Father has the authority to know that time and to know that methodology and to make it happen. It is not for you, he's telling his followers, to take over governments or to rule nations. Anybody hear that? He's saying, I am not giving you governmental authority. Governmental authority on this phase of the earth, that belongs to God and God alone. Anybody hearing that? It is not the church's authority to march into government centers and say, we'll take over now. That will happen someday. 
Jesus will do it, not you or me or his church. And it will happen under the Father's authority. It is not our authority to say we should be in charge now. We are meant to continue the, hello, spiritual ministry of Jesus. And one day, we will rejoice when he takes over the governmental authority of all things. But that's not our task. And we have no authority to force it on anyone. We carry on the spiritual ministry. You know, loving, healing, proclaiming, feeding, clothing. That's what we are meant to do. And we can't do it under our own power. We've already seen that. But the Lord will give us what we need to carry on the spiritual ministry of Jesus. He will give us power, spiritual power, spiritual power to live like him, to love like him, to be like him. He will give us spiritual power. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this, And you, and you all, shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the end of the earth. Let me give you a little bit of personal commentary on verse 8. You know, COVID has made me crazy too. And recently I've been thinking something stupid. That I should get started writing my autobiography. Have you ever heard anything more vain than some guy saying, I should really write about myself. It's so important. I mean, how silly is that? It's dumb. But I just feel drawn to do that. So, <laughs> so I've been thinking about my autobiography. And I think, well, what title would it have? Well, if you wrote your autobiography, what title would you give yours? <laughs> It's kind of an interesting exercise. So I have had several ideas, and the, the top idea that's currently in first place about the title of my autobiography would be this. Don't blame me. <laughs> you made me this way. My life and my ministry. And here's a little background to why that would be my title. I'm a follower of Jesus first and foremost, and honestly, nothing comes even close to being second, although I love my other callings, husband, father, grandpa, pastor. But none of those come anywhere near to my central identity and my main focus, follower of Jesus Christ, child of God by grace. That's your identity today, or today it could start to become your identity but let's be honest, becoming that kind of a person doesn't happen in a vacuum. There's things and people and churches that help you become into that identity. And for me, the Christian tradition that mostly formed me into being that person I am today is the, tradition, the Christian tradition called Lutheranism. I was baptized in a Lutheran church. I attended and was formed in a Lutheran church and a Lutheran home and a Lutheran home and a Lutheran culture. I had my theological education in a Lutheran seminary. I have never served any other kind of church than the Lutheran church. And my resume as being a, a, an excellent Lutheran is long and substantive. And yet, in a number of circles, I'm still not considered a good Lutheran. And we all know why. It's because of my quasi-Pentecostal tendencies. The hand raising, the lame white guy sort of dancing, the speaking in tongues, the prophesying, the laying on of hands for healing and deliverance. It's made people think, yeah, he's kind of not the sort of right Lutheran. Okay. But Lutheran family, for those still out there who are, you made me this way. See, when I was 14 years old, I was kneeling at a communion altar in, the, in my home church through a ritual called confirmation. 
The pastor gave everybody a life verse. He said, Todd, as I kneeled, this is the life verse that God led me to give you. And then he prophesied it over me. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then, along with my parents and my godparents, he laid hands on me like they do, you know, in the book of Acts. And he literally prayed these words, Now, Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Todd the gift of the Holy Spirit. What exactly did you expect to happen? Then I was 17 years old at a youth retreat sponsored by Lutherans. During the Saturday free time, they said, If you want to, you can go up that cabin. There are Lutheran ministers there. They will lay hands on you and pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What exactly did you think was going to happen? Don't blame me for being a crazy Lutheran. You made me this way. And all of that is just to tell you this, which applies to all of us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit with power is available. To all Christians who desire to continue the ministry of Jesus through their lives. You must have this power to genuinely carry on the ministry of Jesus. But the great, good, gracious news is that it's available for all Christians who want to receive it so that they can use the power to bring Jesus forward in their lives and in this generation. A couple more verses for today. Verses 9 through 11. And when Jesus had said these things, as they were looking on, Jesus was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And they said, Men of Galilee, Why are you staring up into the sky? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus is with his boys. Mount of Olives right near Jerusalem. All of a sudden, the glory cloud of God's presence manifested visibly. Jesus walked into it, returned to the spiritual realm, and was no longer seen by their physical eyes. The angels promised a time would come that in that same place, that same cloud of glory would reappear and Jesus would walk out of that cloud and return to this material earth. That's called the ascension and the second coming. But it also gives us theological insight into why our lives are the way they are. This verse and the rest of the Bible teaches That when Jesus created the world by God's authority, he created two spheres that make up one creation. You hear that? Two spheres that make up one creation. He made the material world, the visible world that you touch with your hands and that you can see with your eyes. And he made the spiritual realm, which we cannot see, but which we sense. And we Christians are very unusual human creatures in the sense that we live as creatures in this material world, but we also live as born-again believers in the spiritual realm. We have to manage (laughs) both spheres (laughs) of creation, which is why the Christian life is so fascinating and challenging and sometimes confusing And sometimes frustrating, but always ultimately glorious. We live in reality. We live in reality. Creatures in a material world. Born again, spirit filled souls communing with the spiritual. And managing how we're supposed to be in both of those worlds at any given time is what maturing in Christ and discipleship and small groups and growing in Bible knowledge is all about. 
Like I said, that's the last verse for today, which means that during this exploration of the book of Acts, we're not going to study every verse. That would take us years. What we're going to do, like we did today, is we're going to pull out what I think are the most key verses, and then we're going to summarize the rest of the chapter. So here's the summarization of the rest of the chapter. After Jesus returned to the spiritual realm, his disciples walked back into Jerusalem and stayed in a room and waited, and they prayed. But not just the 12 of them, there was a total of 120 of them in that room for the next 10 days, praying and wanting Jesus and the Holy Spirit, praying and wanting the coming of the Holy Spirit, praying and wanting in perfect unity, in perfect one accord, in perfect focused diligence. Come, Holy Spirit. But there was also one more matter that had to be taken care of, Judas, the betrayer who killed himself, he needed to be replaced, right? You can't have the 11 apostles. That doesn't work. It has to be 12. 12 ancient tribes of ancient Israel, 12 apostles to establish the new Israel, the people of God who believe in Jesus Christ. And the chapter ends describing the process that reestablished the apostles from being 11 to 12. All right, that's Acts chapter 1. Here's the fascinating thing about today's chapter and the chapters ahead. There are a number of specific messages, and at least one of them applies to each one of you today. So let's start going through the list. First of all, for you highly rational, scientific-oriented people, God bless you, never apologize. He made you that way. It's valuable that you're that way. And maybe you've struggled with stuff in the Bible, and I don't get it, and I'm not sure that's true. How am I supposed to think about it? I get it. Well, the central truth of Christianity that holds all the rest of it together is that the man, Jesus of Nazareth, rose from the dead and is alive forevermore. You are invited to prove that to yourself, to put in the research, to use your rational mind, and to ask yourself, what is the most likely logical explanation for this ongoing, extraordinary Jesus phenomenon? Study it. Think through it. I'm excited for what I think will be the result of that kind of intellectual inquiry. Secondly, for those of you who have had some church in your life, know a few Bible study, Bible stories, good, a few good songs, kind of been in and out, and then a lot of out and sort of back in, and <laughs> maybe as a kid, and you know some stuff, which is good. But you realize as listening to me, you know very little about the Holy Spirit. No one's ever taught you. No one's ever explained the relevance. No one ever helped you to come into the experience of the Holy Spirit. Well, friend, your day has so come. (laughs) This is so for you. So please stay with it. And as you understand more, and as your version of that cabin that I walked into 40 years ago or whatever is offered to you, I just, I, just, I just pray that you will walk through your version of that cabin, get prayed for, and receive what was always meant to be yours, the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, let's think about those 120 people in that, in that room for a second. That was the church at its purest, right? Everybody wanted the same thing, to live for Jesus and tell the world about him by receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I've had the dream myself. I've chased it for decades. The pure church. The congregation that really lived as the way the church was designed to be. I've been looking for it my whole life. Still haven't found it. See, uh, the church is a congregation of people, and as soon as people are involved, purity becomes a very difficult issue. But because we acknowledge that, and we must, and we own that, and we should, does not mean that we should not aspire to see the status quo shoved aside and a people serious about aspiring to come closer closer to what the church of Jesus Christ is meant to be. 
And I am on that life journey, and this church is on that life journey. We can't promise purity or perfection in this congregation that's filled with people and led by a sinner. But we do not settle for the status quo at Good Shepherd. We know there's more that Jesus wants to do, will do, and can do through us, and we are pursuing that the best we can by grace looking to him. And if that is something that appeals to you, would you please join this church? Please. Your heart is with us. Please be with us. And we'll journey together. Finally, the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of salvation through Jesus Confirmed by the gift of the Holy Spirit, turns the world upside down. This dear, poor world needs some serious turning upside down. So many issues, so much that really matters. From environment, to justice, to racial issues, economic issues, they all are really important because they all directly impact people. And maybe you're trying to look for your cause or tried some things that you thought would change the world. They just didn't. They just didn't. I love your aspiration, but let me redirect your loyalty. The greatest cause to bring the greatest good to the greatest number of people is for you to follow Jesus Christ. Witness to him and preach his gospel. Show his love, demonstrate his power, and do it in a band of people who are on the same mission. That, my friends, is the cause that will bring the greatest good to the greatest number of people to the greatest degree. It will still turn the world upside down. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, nothing like your word. Nothing like your word, Jesus to reach out and grab us by the heart (laughs) or grab us by the back of our necks sometimes or just to grab us by the throat and say, come on, now's the time. But as always, Jesus, we just trust you at this moment to do your work in our lives, to help us hear the right message today, to start moving in the right direction tomorrow, And to start becoming a part of something that we were born to be a part of. Lord, we commit this journey into the study of the book of Acts to you. Holy Spirit, every outcome that you want to have through this time of study, that's what we want to. So do it, Holy Spirit. For Jesus' sake... To the Father's glory. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to sing another.